Welcome again uh, to TPA's global uh, webinar series. Uh, today we will uh, talk about uh, the holistic approach uh, of a quantitative value chain analysis and how the, that connects to the unified uh, approach the OECD has been uh, proposing. Um, my name is Dave Heibrechts. I'm the CEO of TPA Global, and together with Maria, we, are, we will be your uh, hosts of uh, today's event. Um, with that, let's uh, let's start the slides show. Move to the next slide. So we will do a short introduction of what we believe the world looks like today uh, in the area of transfer pricing and profit allocation, and we will tell you how the last uh, two, two to three years TPA has been further developing uh, a quantitative value chain analysis as a corroborative to transactional transfer pricing. And um, subsequently, we will uh, spend a few minutes on the unified approach. And um, last but not least, we will well try to connect the dots between uh, the unified approach the proposed uh, this year and further developed this year by the OCD with uh, our quantitative DCA. Um, we open the floor at the end for Q and A's. But if you have any questions, there will be there is in the in your uh, screen there is questions you can uh, ask yourself uh, to the uh, presenters team. Um, since you are in a muted mode, it will not be able to uh, ask us questions, but rather type them and we will pick them up and, uh, and try to answer them. So that's the, the approach. If we move to the next slide. Uh, so setting the scene and, and doing an introduction, I think what, what my view of the world is, is that uh, tax, the tax reality we, we knew in the past uh, uh, was different from business reality in some cases. What BAPS really has done is, uh, is move uh, the tax reality and, and sync it fully with uh, the business reality. In simple terms, you um, allocate profits to where the activities are. That's sort of the short notion of uh, how BAPS has changed the world. Uh, now the, the, the question we're looking at, uh, the question mark we're looking at in this uh, slide is whether the, um, the new uh, tax Le legislation, which which is also using a new nexus concept and a new uh, at arm's length concept, uh, is mainly politically driven and has a focus of moving more profits into uh, the markets where the users or consumers are located, uh, irrespective whether that. Uh, location is actually a location where the multinational has any significant operations in. So the question here is whether the business reality as we all know it, uh, which is hard to manipulate because you're running your business the way you do, whether we, we will be moving uh, later this year to a more political uh, modified system of uh, what, what BAPS has, uh, has brought us. Um, to, to answer a part of that question, uh, we will uh, uh, now start looking at the quantitative VCA as TPA typically uses it. We move to the next slide. So we have a, um, a quantitative VCA. Uh, in today's world, it is a corroborative method to a transactional transfer pricing. So transfer pricing on, on a transfer of goods, uh, services or intangibles um, can be uh, can be looked at on a transactional base, but you then at the end of the day want to know how that has sliced the total profit pie uh, to various locations or various uh, various functions. Um, quantitative ECA by a lot of people is perceived as a subjective approach to a profit allocation. Um, and what we will uh, be teaching you today is that there is more objective ways to to deal with quantitative VCA. Uh, again, 
<coughs> quantitative ECA should not be confused with a profit split method because it's not. It's, it has a, a different approach to uh, the the whole scheme of transfer pricing uh, in the first place because it is in in this particular case a corroborative to the transactional methods. Um, TPA and and other um, other corporates, as we know, uh, are using this uh, quantitative VCA and try to make it more objective by adding a uh, what we call a three anchor approach to make it more objective. One is, is there a regulatory framework which requires VCA to be in place? Um, second is, can we uh, extract from uh, an industry-wide data set uh, and look at that from an economical and statistical relevant perspective? Can we identify the in independent variables which drive uh, EBIT, uh, which uh, uh, trigger the EBIT line? Um, and last but not least, uh, it is, is everything in terms of quantification and allocation really in line with uh, the BAPS compliant framework as we know it uh, from, from the OECD. Where we distinguish uh, uh, quantitative VCA, uh, and we have two versions. One is a simple uh, approach where basically quantification and allocation takes place at the same time. Um, maybe a, a good example to illustrate that is the uh, the formula apportionment um, or the um, uh, the CCCTB in uh, in in Europe, where um, the, uh, the three factors, people, sales, and assets, get one third uh, car, uh, one third uh, quantification, um, and and subsequently uh, include an allocation in the same formula. So that's what we call a simple simplified or simple uh, quantitative VCA, while a complex version uh, lo looks first at the circle uh, uh, reflecting the whole profit, does a carve out, a quantification, what portion of the profit belongs to what activity or what location, uh, sorry, what activity, and then as a step two allocates the, the, the profit relating to that activity back into the specific country or legal entity. That's what we call a complex approach. So um, if we then move to the first anchor, the regulatory framework, <clears throat> we have a few um, rules in a few countries which already indicate that if you do transfer pricing at the transactional level, these tax authorities still want to see a value chain analysis, uh, sometimes in a fairly high degree of abstraction, um, uh, but sometimes very detailed. Huh? So Germany um, is talking about a value contribution analysis. Uh, Australia, in its guidelines of 2017, has also emphasized uh, the use of value chain analysis as part of the disclosure they're expecting uh, companies to come up with. Um, I think China has been very specific in its notice 42 um, that the local TP file needs to carry a quantifiable value chain analysis. Uh, so far, that has resulted in a fairly high level uh, degree of reporting. Uh, you're, you're stating this entity in the whole value chain of the whole group makes 1% of the whole EBIT of the whole group. So then the quantification part is relatively limited. Uh, we expect that to, to be expanded to a much better understanding, uh, not only a, a simple quantification, my group entity in China makes 1% of the EBIT of the whole group. Um, last but not least, South Africa has introduced um, um, some uh, some regulations which basically tell that uh, the group companies in South Africa acting with group companies outside South Africa uh, need on a transactional basis be able to, to give a description of the value chain and even at the level of quantifying uh, 
who gets what portion of the margin on one particular journal entry and transaction. Uh, so that's that's pretty detailed and, uh, and and fairly refined from a quantitative value chain analytical perspective. So this is the regular framework. So yes, there's uh, 10, 15 countries roughly who state very explicitly in their regulations they need this. So you know that's one anchor to say okay then I need to perform this. Then let's go to the second anchor uh, a little bit quicker that um, we are looking at the OECD guidelines in 17 um, where the the, the industry-wide framework so the variables which which are the base for the allocation of the profits are being addressed. Um, so we see here on this slide the, the asset and capital-based keys which can be used or the cost-based keys which can be used. Um, again, they basically make a statement that these keys you're using should have some strong correlation with uh, the, the tangibles and intangible assets or capital being used in controlled transactions. Uh, but also there is uh, there is other allocation keys like half counts and um, uh, people being referred to. The, the specific criteria the OECD has, has put into this uh, OECD guideline 17 is it needs to be based on objective, comparable data, preferably um, coming from uh, internal use purposes or with a reference to external market data. And uh, the keys um, should indicate the relative contribution of the parties, uh, again, measured in uh, what we know as the traditional functions, risks, and assets game. Um, so this is the reflection of BAPS into the OECD guidelines. If we make it more precise in the next slide, then we can say, okay, the, the complex quantitative ECA comes with a, a two-step approach. The first step is a quantification. What are the criteria the BAPS reports and the guidelines of 2017 have imposed on that quantification? And quantification means you have a total profit pie and you slice it into pieces and one piece is for the R&D, one piece is for the distribution function. Um, that quantification step one needs to, and this is sort of a, a more practical approach to, to things, needs to be based on objective data, comparable data. The quantification should be, uh, should rely on economically significant uh, functions, risks, and assets and should uh, have a strong and relative consistent correlation between the variables which drive your profit. Uh, so that's the quantification step one. Once you've done that, you carved out, okay, my distribution function deserves 25% of the total profit. How are you going to uh, reallocate or allocate those 25% 20, back into the countries? Well, again, that's Step two on the on this slide, where the allocation keys again, uh, with the references uh, to the uh, uh, the BEPS reports, uh, need to be based on objective data, external market data, the relative contribution. And again, they say there should be a strong correlation between the allocation key and the value created. And the value created and the allocation keys could be read as that as any independent variable. Uh, which uh, drives uh, the value created, and the value created in, in our terminology is the EBIT line, so the earnings before interest and tax uh, for that uh, for that purpose. So another um, set of references is uh, is more recent. Uh, borrowed a little bit from the profit split, although you heard me correctly say there is no. Quantitative ECA is not a profit split approach. Um, in the the report uh, of 2018 on the revised guidance on the application of transactional profit split method, again you see same similar wording coming back as uh, allocation keys. You split profits on 
and here the profits are not defined as the total or the residual profit, by the way, but if you slice profits, you can do that based on asset, capital, or cost allocation keys, and here the, the other keys which they consider relevant and, and acceptable is incremental sales, employee compensation, or even headcount for that matter. And, and any appropriate key which has this strong correlation uh, might fit into the, the ballpark of being um, acceptable to the, uh, to the OECD as well. So this gives, uh, I think, a pretty good industry framework for the next um, approach and here we we are looking at the following um, you you most of you will know there's a typical process how do you select comparables for transactional uh, and the, that approach is uh, is being highlighted in uh, uh, section 3.4 of the OCD guidelines 2017 here you find a equivalent step plan, uh, how do you come up with a, um, a reliable approach to quantitative value chain analysis and what are the steps you should be taking to get uh, to a easy to replicate also by an other stakeholder, say tax authorities, process to, to deal from, uh, to go from a, a set of data points in this case, uh, the data points could be uh, the data points of all the major players in an industry. And once you select all of that data and uh, you analyze it, uh, you come up with ranges. You come up with the distributor in this industry typically takes 25% of the profit home, things like that. Well, if that is... Uh, the, the process you're running, then these eight steps are your equivalent to the steps for transactional transfer pricing. Uh, the variables uh, you see on the right um, metrics, uh, there's about 16 variables, is based on academic research um, on the, the correlation between on one side independent variables, uh, which on the other side uh, drive the dependent variable, and this is uh, me talking statistical terms now, um, and the, the dependent variable in this case is EBIT, is your operating margin we're, we're looking at. So you will, you, you see there's cost-based, there's asset-based, uh, there's people-based, headcount-based, uh, variables in in this uh, 16 uh, uh, list of 16 independent variables. Um, I, I now hand over to uh, Maria, who will take you through two uh, cases we worked on, and there's about um, this state's TPA has worked on about 12 industries. We will take you through a pharma case and a apparel industry case, just to showcase to you how this, this uh, all adds up to um, a data set industry-wide um, indicating which of these variables really drive the profit uh, line. Maria? To give you an overview, when we looked at the pharmaceutical industry, we divided it in four categories. In the traditional, the biological, the biosimilar, and, gen and the gen generic one. Uh, here we will look only in the traditional and the biological one. In this slide, we can visualize, we can see the companies that we extract the data from. Uh, in uh, the steps before, it was mentioned the, that we have to select the countries, the companies, that they have the highest uh, market share. And we were basically looking on the sales. So here we can uh, see some of the biggest companies that represent uh, this industry. For example, Bayer or Sanofi from the traditional one, or Emgen from uh, the biological one. Uh, here is the results that we got from the econometrical um, and statistical analysis that we did. 
if we look first uh, on the pie chart, we can see that uh, for the traditional pharmaceutical industry, the key allocation, the allocation keys are the cost of goods sold, research and development expenses, and the financial assets. Whereas for the biological, is R&D expenses and financial assets. It's really interesting. It's really important to mention that the two tables are um, basically the results from the regression analysis. In the fourth uh, column, where, with the title beta, represents the coefficient. So it's actually the effect that one the independent variable has in uh, on the EBIT. And um, yeah, so in order to accept a variable, it needs to be econometrical econometric significance. Uh, that can be seen by the stars that they are displayed also in the same column. So in order to help you um, understand how you can read a table like, like that is, for example, for the financial assets, we can say that if there is an increase by one euro in the financial assets, then the effect on EBIT will be an increase by 0 0.2 um, euros. And we can see that this uh, variable, we can accept it. It's uh, it, on the same table. It's interesting to look also on the marketing expenses, where even if uh, we can see that the, there are stars or the number is significant, we don't accept this variable. That is happening because it has a negative effect on EBIT. So increasing marketing expenses reduces EBIT uh, if everything else uh, is federis paribus, of course. Um, that the, the reason why we didn't accept this variable is that it's not easy uh, to allocate profit on uh, when we have negative um, value contribution. Uh, really important also is to mention that when we did this analysis, the statistical programs, uh, they um, on the results we could see how many, how much of the EBIT was being explained by the variables that we use. Uh, in the case of the traditional uh, pharmaceutical industry, we could see that is also there that uh, is 76 percent of the EBIT was explained, whereas on the by using the same number of uh, variables in the biological pharmaceutical, it was 79 percent of the EBIT um, explained. So this uh, this is the uh the statistical uh, relevance of uh, the independent variables and their influence on uh, dependent variable profit. Um, what we typically would add to this is also the economic uh, analysis. So we would take an, an industry analysis, a qualitative industry analysis, and say which of these uh, 16 variables we showed to you before um, do uh, from uh, qualitative industry analysis description seem to drive the profit in this particular industry. And that, that might differ from this statistical list. This statistical list is purely based on uh, industry-wide data sets and nothing more over a, um, um, a couple of years uh, uh, collected. And, and that gives you these statistical results. Uh, a funny, uh, a funny example we we've seen in the automotive industry is if you hire one more guy or girl in the automotive industry, your profit goes down with uh, fourteen thousand dollars. So apparently, in that industry, having more people on board doesn't necessarily contribute to your bottom line um, in in that analysis. I'll move to the next example, I think. Yes. So here uh, is about the apparel industry. We again split it in two categories, the luxury and the fast fashion. And uh, here are the companies that we selected in order to, to collect the data for. The results we can see, they are much different than in the previous uh, example with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, Basically, in both of the segments of uh, this industry, we could see that uh, FTEs, COGS, and marketing expenses are allocation, are allocation keys, uh, whereas in the luxury apparel industry, we could also add the tangible assets 
whereas on the fa fast fashion one, only the total assets. Uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting in this um, uh, slide to mention that as uh, marketing expenses are in both uh, uh, industries um, significant, the effect is much different. So in the luxury uh, apparel, we could see that uh, an increase in marketing expenses will lead in an increase of a bit by 67 um, cents, whereas uh, an in the same increase in the fast fashion will uh, result in 1.4 euros. So it's almost a little bit more than doubled. Um, and yeah, we could see also that uh, in these data sets that we collected, uh, a higher number of, we have a higher explanation, uh, like 97% of uh, the EBIT has been explained and 80%. Um, that's uh, a result that comes from the data, not all the times so we could uh, control that. Well, actually we can't control that. This is just a reflection of uh, throwing the data set into a statistical uh, piece of software and, and yes there is different software tools out there so you need to be aware that if you throw it in one piece of software maybe it, it does approach the data set slightly different uh, but uh, roughly speaking uh, this is an, an, a non-controlled outcome you throw all data of all the industry in this is what you get um, and interesting also is to mention that for the fast fashion, we chose to insert in the regression analysis the total assets instead of tangible and intangible because they had the higher explanatory variable on this uh, industry. So that's why in the one um, regression, we are include, included total assets and the other one we include tangible, intangible, or inventory, etc. So basically what, uh, and, and you can read that in the booklet, which uh, the source is at the bottom, um, we, we done sensitivity analysis. So we threw in different independent variables to see how st statistically significant the impact would be of, uh, of that variable on the, on the profit line. And again, these independent variables cannot influence each other uh, in relationship to the profit line. That's why we call them independent. And, uh, that's exactly what this statistical analysis is doing. Okay, enough said on that. Thanks, uh, Maria. Then we move to the unified approach. So we, now we, we're taking a step fast forward. Uh, so 2019, the uh, OECD came up with uh, three proposals on how to deal with the big tech giants. That was the initial plan and how to more appropriate compensate the the country where the market uh, in terms of users and consumers was um, that all that uh, late uh, 2019 to unified approach which uh, the, the the purpose of that unified approach is create a new nexus and profit allocation for large multinationals uh, create new taxing rights to the market where the user or the consumer jurisdiction uh, was um, the OECD always says with each next report that they achieve less complexity, which I'd rather uh, put a question mark with um, uh, because each new methodology requires a transition as well. Uh, there, there, there would be some coexistence between the arms length principle and uh, they try to limit the disruption there of uh, the uh, 2000 uh, pages of BAPS report. Avoid double taxation and tax disputes and uh, create some consensus. Um, the question here is to whom does this unified approach apply? Uh, well, to distributors and probably mostly retailers in general, so not only to the digital giants. It, it will have in the initial phase a threshold, um, and we just as an illustration put the CBCR threshold in. Um, it, it might only apply to businesses who generate at least 25 million in the country where the users and the distributors are located. So below that threshold, this extra new taxing rights would not uh, be hitting uh, the company. 
and it would typically apply to highly profitable companies. And just to give you an illustration, um, uh, the next slide gives, I think, the example, correct? No, this is still talking about the three factors. So um, the factor B is you give a standard compensation um, industry-wide to the distributor in that industry, to the distribution function. You also carve out, and this is very much a step one approach following our quantitative DCA, you also give a separate compensation to, say, the owner of the brand uh, who receives a royalty. And then the, um, the, the, the leftover profit is being uh, partially allocated to the market where the user and the consumer is being located. Um, and that's what we will illustrate in a minute. Uh, typically, if I take B and C and I deduct that from total profit, I'm left with a residual profit. A residual profit in a value chain could range between, uh, roughly speaking, 40 to 70%. There's, there's, there's more extreme cases, but roughly speaking, that, that, uh, that is uh, a fair statement. But bear in mind that only happens if the profit in the whole value chain is, is, is big enough. Uh, so this is what, what was on the previous slide, the highly profitable businesses. So if a business only makes 5%, then the 5% will be absorbed by the B and C factor, and there will be no A factor left. If you have 10% uh, of profit, uh, maybe... Um, the, the residual will be 40%, uh, which is 4%, um, and, and a portion of that 4% needs to be allocated to the marketplace. Uh, so, so that's an illustration. And, and you can continue if you have 20% uh, operating margin, there's a very high likelihood your residual profit is, uh, might be even 70 70%, so 14% of the 20 is then the residual, uh, and a bigger portion is going to be allocated uh, to, the, uh, to the country where the, the distribution function resides. Right? So that's, that's a little bit what this mechanism means. And now we have an example, I think, on the next slide. Um, so here we have a global profits of 16. Uh, we have a routine uh, profit. That's the factor B. Uh, say that's the dis that's the, the the compensation to the distribution function of six. And we're left with a residual of uh, ten. Let's assume the residual uh, portion of the residual, um, and, and and this is where where the suggestion by the OECD is made in uh, public appearances uh, more than anything. They say probably of this residual, 40, 50 percent should be allocated to the distribution function, um, which in this case, uh, 40 percent of the 10 is four. And, and then that's the step one. That's my quantification. Now I need to make the step two in this analysis, this unified approach analysis. I need to bring the 4% back or the 4 back to the countries. And in this particular case, the uh, 4 is being allocated based on a sales allocation key, where in, if in this case, 25% of your consumers or users are is in China, that will be the allocation to, to China. And we borrowed uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn de Souza. I had a talk with Glenn just before Christmas on this example, so it's quite a, quite an interesting calculation example on how the ABC formula under the unified approach does carry a step one and a step two approach, very similar to the quanti quantifiable, um, uh, sorry, quantitative VCA. So here the the two questions which really um, are, are challenging what will be the arm's length principle of the residual profit allocated, allocable to the market. So if you, rather than do a 40 or 50% political allocation key, uh, you look at the real numbers like we did with the statistics, uh, statistical analysis uh, we showed, uh, shown to you before. 
would the outcome be different? And the answer is, of course, it would be different uh, because you can, cannot assume in each market 40, 50% of whatever leftover residual profit goes always to the distribution function. I think that is a, a very much a political choice. And then how to allocate the market uh, the market profit of the residual profit back to the countries. Here, sales is used, but as we already educated you on the quantitative DCA, a couple of keys are quite useful and, and uh, uh, can be used to allocate that uh, profit back into the countries. That is uh, where, where we are at this uh, point in, uh, in time. If we move to oh yeah this is this is interesting because we we looked at the the various representation that people did to that unified approach and i think a few of them are very interesting to to address uh, i see we get some questions in but let's take a look at it uh, in the, in a in a minute um amazon has written their comments and i i like their approach they say uh, our principle one on this unified approach is very simple. Uh, we, we, we are uh, levying tax on profits and losses, not on revenue. Um, because if we levy on revenue, we, we make a, um, uh, we, we uh, hit on the indirect taxation uh, mechanism and we want to keep this uh, direct tax uh, mechanism uh, in place. Uh, second principle they, they talk about, they say, uh, let's apply this economically in a principled way. So the mechanism for profit sharing should be the same as the mechanism for loss sharing. Uh, otherwise, we're not economically consistent and it will be a mess. Um, then next, they say, be proportionate, neutral, equitable, and enforceable. So they basically say it's not only big tech giants, but it's all industries we really should be looking uh, at. Um, again, they reiterate, it should be a direct taxation only. Um, again, not indirect tax taxation. Uh, they, they basically say they want to achieve um, consensus and ma maximize consistency in the applications. Well, as, as we just illustrated with the factor A, B, and C, but before that with the quantifiable VCA uh, approach by TPA, uh, there is quite a few ways to allocate the leftover tax uh, back into the countries. So the consistency of application would certainly be, uh, be uh, need to be adhered to to avoid, uh, that's the next uh, principle six, um, to avoid or better to impose mandatory mechanisms on a, uh, on, a, on an effective dispute resolution. So avoid double taxation. And again, uh, create clear and simple rules to comply with and provide collaboration on transition relief. That, that means a little bit all countries will uh, introduce these unified approaches, assume it, it gets through the consensus model at the OECD, and all, not only gets pushed through from a political perspective, um, each and every country will have a different uh, pace of introducing this into its legislation. So you, you want to avoid, you have to do half of the countries already on the unified approach, and the other half, you're still uh, following the old BAPS only, uh, BAPS compliant rules. So I, I thought this was a quite a, a, a nice summary of, uh, of where um, OECD probably needs to look into uh, to, uh, to keep the unified approach a reasonable, logical approach with some simplifications as they say themselves uh, for corporates as well. So with that, um we we sort of before we go to the last slide i wanna there was a question um with the statistic analysis who decides which independent variation to be used for different industries um 
thanks, Lindsay, for, for this question. Uh, the, the analysis, uh, the statistical analysis, uh, we loaded each of the industries with, um, I think, of the 16 variables we found in literature, there's about 10 variables we could find, easily find the data for in the public domain. So yes, we uh, we have not been able to fully adhere to the 16 variables uh, selection, uh, but only had to take um, a, a, a shortcut uh, in uh, finding about 10 of the 16 variables had easy trackable and traceable data points in the public domain in annual reports on the internet, on websites of companies or annual reports. So that defined uh, and, and, and shortened the list of 16 variables which were indicated in literature a little bit. But on average, I thought this, this approach was, uh, because it was, it was uh, using the worldwide industry data set, it was less biased than a lot of the searches I've been seeing in my whole life uh, doing transactional transfer pricing. Uh, it's, it's a more coherent pool of data uh, with statistical and, and analysis. You, you can't really change the outcome on very, very easily. And, and for that reason also, we've done that, uh, that sensitivity analysis. One more question? Two more questions. Um, so the second one, I count why some yeah. variables are negative correlated with EPITs. We, we're some variables negative correlated with EPITs are coupled with an upward arrow. Okay, if if that happens, uh, there must be uh, there must be a typo. Uh, if uh, if those are negative, then I expect that that to be correlated in a negative way with EBIT as well. So if if the number, the data number is a negative, Maria, then it indicates a negative impact on EBIT if you increase that uh, that independent variable with one dollar. Correct. So I think the question is there might have been one or two errors where that was not happening. Um, a good question from uh, Vincent uh, Renault from Paris. Uh, in the luxury industry, why intangible uh, assets are not considered? Well, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, measuring intangible assets on the balance sheet of uh, these companies like LVMH is not that easy. Uh, simply because they generated uh, in a lot of cases, although the recent example is, is different uh, when they were buying another luxury company, but most of these intangibles are not on the balance sheet. Uh, so it's very hard to get that data set uh, in, the, in the pool of the luxury companies uh, identified. Uh, that's also the reason why we say, okay, the luxury companies and apparel with any industry, you can't simply rely on a quantitative VCA on these statistical uh, relevant and significant analysis because that's one side of the equation, but you also need to look into the industry analysis for that industry and from that industry analysis also uh, extract um, the, what the industry analysis write-up describes as value drivers in the industry. Uh, it's the combination between the two, uh, especially if both uh, uh, do say this is relevant to drive profits, then obviously you have a very strong case that both the data points from the industry support your case as well as the industry analysis, uh, a solid industry analysis does. So never read the statistics in isolation. That's basically um, uh, an answer to that question. I think that's sort of, so if there's any questions, please, uh, please uh, share them with us. Um, there is a um, question which we tried to address during this, uh, this, this uh, webinar, where we said, okay, we have a VCA approach, and that's the slide you're, you're looking at. 
and we have a unified approach. What is really different in the two? Uh, well, in step one, we do carve-outs. We do quantification and carve-outs. And uh, the quantification and carve-outs is uh, to some extent also uh, very much what is happening with the factor B and C in the unified approach. You do a carve-out of something you really understand, like a distribution function, like a royalty on a brand, uh, et, et cetera. And, and both these uh, quantification steps do follow, at least for factor B and C as well, the arm's length principle. And, and typically, it means both in step one under the VCA approach, as well as step one under the unified approach, you're left with a, a, a leftover residual profit, um, which um, you need to uh, allocate back into the, into the countries. Um, that's where step two comes, uh, uh, comes uh, in the VCA approach as allocate residual based on the number of variables. And we already looked at the relevant variables, which we believe is a base for that allocation back into the countries, uh, both from a regulatory anchor, from an industry relevant anchor, and from the BEPS relevant uh, set of criteria uh, on those allocation keys. Um, in the unified approach, that's where I think the, the whole approach starts becoming different. Uh, in the unified approach, once you give a portion of the profit to factor B and C, you're left with A, and A is the, uh, actually you're left with a, a residual profit, of which a portion of that residual profit is your factor A. And the factor A is assumed to be the margin allocable to the distribution function, um, where it, it becomes a, for, uh, a formula based um, have based on the first users in line or the sales line of of uh, the, um, the the sales to consumers in that particular country as the allocation key. Uh, so in the unified approach, your leftover residual 50 percent will be related to the distribution function. And the big difference is for that distribution function under the unified approach, you do not necessarily need to have a, a physical presence of value creation in the country, in the market of the user or the consumer to still be taxable in that country. Uh, so if Google says they don't have a presence in France, but they have 10% of, of their customers in France, and still that 10% of customers or users of Google will trigger a corporate income tax reportable in the French corporate income tax return. Uh, which is, by the way, different from the choice the French government took, um, where the French government said, well, you know, we're not going to wait for this ABC or whenever that's going to land, but we're going to already make a statement that uh, if Google generates any revenue uh, through French users and consumers, then um, we're just going to assume 3% of that revenue line is taxable income of Google in the French territory. So they took a different approach, a unilateral one country approach, which was um, a little bit the approach which was published early 2019, and they are now pushing through. As you can imagine, the uh, the um, Americas, uh, the, the, the government, uh, the IRS is not particularly happy on the, on that approach. So, um, in short, the the, the question uh, I think which is is still open and most relevant whether uh, to address the point is the VCA approach we use uh, a very same or similar to the unified approach is really uh, uh, can only be answered when we uh, have the nexus definitions of users and markets. Uh, so what is a user of a Google uh, um, a bar on a computer? Um, is that, uh, we had a long discussion, is that someone which generates income 
uh, for Google um, uh, at, at the services level, at the direct uh, level with that customer, or is that uh, a user of Google which triggers a uh, advertising income stream of Google on the back end of their earnings model? Uh, so Google gets uh, uh, pays, uh, gets paid for a click on a luxury good advertisement by a user in France, um, or does it even go beyond the user to actually click on a um, uh, an advertisement and convert it into a sale of uh, of, uh, of a service or a goods? Uh, so there's there's a user definition and a market definition which is far away from clear, and I think it really depends on how realistic these definitions will be, uh, whether we're looking at an equitable proposition on the, the unified approach. Um, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, there is a, under, uh has asked a question, how do you account for the time lag between R&D expenses and the much later potential generation of profits? That is a very difficult question uh, under uh, the um, the relationship between R and D and the return on the intellectual property R and D has created, uh, which is going to typically happen a, lo a lot later, is something these statistical approaches are not giving you a great answer on. Uh, so that, that I think you, you have to be fair. These are data points, and we apply statistics to it. So you will, uh, if if companies um, have a higher R and D to sales ratio over a continuous longer period of time, you typically do see a correlation between that higher R and D and the higher EBIT line. Uh, so. So to give you an example, in the pharma industry, I know you're in the pharma industry. When we looked uh, a couple of years ago in the, the uh, patented pharma industry, they were spending 10% more R&D to sales ratio than the generic pharma. And uh, de facto, that delivered about 10% extra EBIT income um, at the level of the patented pharma. Uh, so it was almost like a hundred percent return on that r and d so there is there are ways to to uh, to make the connect between the r and d expenditures to sales ratio and ultimately the income you you get from it um, I think at this point in time we're almost there, um, unless there's any. Uh, Vincent just put a uh, last note uh, to give me the latest on France. Uh, France just made an agreement with US to postpone the digital sales tax until OECD has agreed for the new rules. Okay, so the, this is the 3% example I just gave. Uh, apparently, uh, the pressure of the U.S. and the, the amicable solution France and the U.S. Uh, have chosen is let's wait for the OECD first and then see how we take that 3% um, unilateral measure forward. Um, I think that's good news. At least it doesn't create another layer of chaos and therefore double taxation for, for most of the corporates. Okay, I, I think we're sort of running out of time. So thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, it was a, a good crowd, so a lot of questions. Uh, please uh, be aware there will be another webinar next week uh, where we will address the link between uh, DAC6 reporting corporates and intermediates need to do towards the tax authorities on non labs compliant transactions in Europe. And how does that link uh, back to your the reporting on and certain tax positions you're doing for the uh, for the stock exchange. So that will be an, an interesting webinar next week. Uh, I know the week after there will be a webinar on uh, VAT technology in the UK, where the UK government uh, 
um, HMRC is putting a lot of pressure on corporates to um, to deal with uh, data uh, data sets being reported for that reasons in a very digitalized manner. So please uh, stay tuned on um, on on TPA webinars and um, and uh, try to keep track through our website on registrations. If there's any follow-up questions, please uh, uh, please contact us uh, directly. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and um, enjoy your uh, day.